role of the UAE in terms of supporting interfaith um, dialogue. So on that note, I would like to introduce our next speaker that I'm really actually excited to introduce, um, Dr. Andrew Decourt, who is the co-director of the Neighbor Love Ethiopian Movement, and will be talking to us about unlocking interfaith flourishing. So Dr. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. And whenever you're ready, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ms. Lena. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Is that coming through? Great. Yes. Good morning, everyone. I want to begin by thanking Mr. Talal, Ms. Lena, and the UAE Embassy for kindly inviting me to speak at this important webinar. I had the privilege of attending the Human Fraternity Conference at the UN's Economic Commission for Africa in 2021, and I'm so delighted that this gathering is continuing. I want to begin by saying that I deeply love Ethiopia's diverse peoples and cultures. I have lived, learned, and loved in Ethiopia since 2004. And for many years after that, I have been privileged to serve as a pastor, a professor of ethics, and a peace advocate in Ethiopia. I'm also privileged to be married to an incredibly strong and brilliant Ethiopian woman. And I want to begin by expressing my deep love and enduring gratitude for the peoples of Ethiopia. Um, this morning, I'd like to share briefly about a spirituality that can unlock interfaith flourishing. And my message is going to be simple. God calls each one of us God's beloved child. And when we can uh, accept this divine love in the roots of our being, three things get unlocked. First, the confidence to cherish the belovedness of others. Second, the courage to confess our failures, and third, the compassion to care for the suffering of others. When we practice this spirituality, it unlocks interfaith friendship and ethics education for our shared flourishing. But let me go back a little bit in history first. Before Jesus launched his public movement, he traveled out into the wilderness. Uh, Jesus got some distance from the dominant voices of power, money, and religion in his society. And in that open place, Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River. And with water washing over his body, Jesus sees heaven open, and he hears God's voice speak to him. I wonder what you might think God says to Jesus. God says in this moment, you are my beloved child. I delight in you. Now, this is a word of goodness, of pleasure, of joy. It's as if God says to Jesus, I see myself in you. You are good and bring me happiness. I value you and accept you. Of course, we know that Jesus was born into an impoverished family. By this point in his life, Jesus had survived an atrocious political massacre ordered by the governor of Jerusalem. He had experienced displacement and spent time in Egypt as a refugee. And then he grew up in a rural village that many mocked as good for nothing. So Jesus was intimately familiar with violence, trauma, and suffering. Uh, perhaps his experience as a youth was similar to youth in Shire or Walega or Shoa Rovit or Abala today. Still, when Jesus journeys away from the centers of power, this is the voice that Jesus hears. You are my beloved child. I delight in you. And I believe that this voice became the center of Jesus' life. And it's the reason why Jesus went on to teach the most radical moral vision in history, and that is love your enemies. Jesus was so secure in God's love for him 
that Jesus could see his enemies with dignity and compassion. Jesus was safe in God's value that he didn't need to intimidate, exclude, or attack anyone. Even as Jesus was executed by the religious and political authorities, we hear him cry out, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, I believe this is God's sacred word for all of us to hear. We are God's beloved children, and God delights in our existence. Each of us, in our own unique identities and shared humanity, are God's children. This is the foundation of human fraternity, of seeing and treating one another as sisters and brothers instead of as strangers or enemies. The famous Harvard professor Henry Nouwen wrote, quote, you are my beloved child reveals the most intimate truth about all human beings, whether they belong to any particular tradition or not. And I'd like to point out quickly that all of our sacred traditions echo this divine voice and the precious value of human life. In Hebrew scripture, we read, God created humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. God blessed them, and God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. This text affirms that every person is created as a glimpse of God with original blessing and goodness. And later in scripture, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. It's a word of incredible tenderness and commitment. If we go to the Holy Quran, of course, we know that the first verse says, in the name of Allah, the, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy. It then affirms that every human life is so precious that it carries the sacred value of the entire human family. Quote, if anyone kills a person, it is as if they kill all humankind. Well, if anyone saves a life, it is as if they save all humankind. And so the Quran teaches that God created us to recognize one another's God, God-given value. Quote, people, we created you all from a single man and a single woman and made you into races and tribes so that you should recognize one another. I love that text. We were created to recognize one another. And, and the Quran goes on to say that mindfulness of God unlocks this consciousness. Now, this is why the prophet Muhammad warns us, beware of hatred. It strips you of your religion. Now, I want to ask, what happens when our religion is stripped and we can't hear this divine voice of our belovedness. I want to suggest that we become insecure. We feel like we need to prove that we are good, valuable, and important. We compete with one another for recognition. We start defining who's in, who's out, who's higher, who's lower, who's more, who's less. And this means that we become isolated and aggressive. Now, I want to have a confession here that I've battled with these tendencies in my own life, um, and perhaps you have as well. When I'm not listening for God's voice of love, I want to prove that I'm more important, that I'm smart, that I'm powerful, uh, maybe that I'm higher than other people. But I found that this competitive mindset only leads to comparison, conflict, loss, and suffering. And when this divine voice is silenced, we begin to other. And I see this as one of the primary challenges facing human society today. We see others as less or unrelated to ourselves. That's the breakdown of fraternity. We see them as the problem. We complain and blame and attack. Uh, we start seeing and talking about others as if they're all the same. Um, when things get really, really othered, we begin calling people cancers, hyenas, weeds, 
devils. We say these things about people that God has made and created us to recognize. The result in the collective ego is what we could call religious nationalism. And religious nationalism really says we are more, they are less, we are chosen, they are cheap, we belong, they are conditional. Now, of course, this is the mindset that the prophet Muhammad said strips us of our religion. It leads to religious leaders who support violence, to politicians who promise prosperity but deliver poverty, to the horror of drones bombing villages. We act strong, but secretly we are insecure, and so we become reactive, aggressive, and violent. And in this way, we lose true power, creativity, and flourishing. But I want to flip this around and ask, what happens when we receive this divine voice of love and we let it penetrate our hearts in our communities? What happens when we internalize, you are my beloved children, I delight in you? Let me mention just three outcomes that are, are crucial for unlocking inner faith flourishing. The first is this, when we know that we are loved, we unlock the confidence to share this belovedness with others. We see others' dignity and we become presences of peace. Because I am loved, I don't need to fear you or try to intimidate you or make you less than me. I want you to know how beautiful you are how gifted you are, how much we have to share with each other. I no longer see you as a stranger or enemy. You're my neighbor, my sibling, and God's sacred family with equal value. And your joy brings me joy. Second, when we know that we're loved, we unlock the courage to confess the ways that we have humiliated and hurt one another. We no longer need to lie or hide our failures. We can confess the truth with humility. I'm sorry. I thought I would feel more important if I made you feel less important. I thought I would make my community safer by making your community more insecure. I thought I would achieve justice by returning injustice upon you. I was wrong. Please forgive me. I don't want to devalue or dominate you. I want togetherness. Please let go of my failures and let us start rewriting our story together. We are we, God's beloved children. And third, when we know that we are loved, we unlock the compassion to feel the pain of others. Our hearts are softened to feel the pain even of our enemies. They are also made and loved by God. Slowly, I take no pleasure in their pain. The thought of another person suffering becomes disgusting to me. Compassion goes deeper than my passion. Hate becomes a sickening poison. I let go of my hard heart and I discover what Jesus taught. We meet God in the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the sick, the outsider, and the prisoner. Now, don't these people sound like the victims of Ethiopia's civil war? Jesus says that they are reflections of God, and how we treat them is how we treat the divine. Divine belovedness unlocks our compassion for the suffering of others. Friends, when we can hear this divine voice that echoes across our diverse traditions, you are my beloved children, we learn that we share belovedness, we can confess our failures, and we can grow in compassion. To put this in other language, we share dignity, humility, and empathy. This spiritual transformation unlocks two crucial outcomes in our public life that I want to conclude with. First, our divine belovedness is the spiritual 
foundation of interfaith friendship, dialogue, and mutual flourishing. We don't need to compete. We don't need to struggle against one another. All of our sacred traditions contain echoes of this divine word, you are my beloved, I delight in you. Let us learn to hear these words of fraternity and speak them to one another across the boundaries of religion, politics, and ethnicity. I am a Christian, but some of my most meaningful encounters with God have been with Muslim brothers and sisters. I say, let us become friends and get to know one another. Like the Holy Quran teaches, let us recognize one another. Second, our divine belovedness is also the moral foundation of public education in interfaith ethics. Let us teach our students that Hebrew scripture says that all people reflect God's sacred image and that God commands us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Let us teach our students that Christian scripture says that we are God's beloved children and God commands us to love even our enemies. Let us teach our children that Islamic scripture says that we are all created by God to recognize one another and commanded to be good to our neighbors near and far. Let us educate our children to understand that democratic law and culture builds upon this sacred foundation where our diversity and humanity, our rights and responsibilities are held together. Of course, we know that ignorance leads to intolerance, and intolerance leads to extremism. So let us educate the coming generations in interfaith ethics. Please understand, this does not mean asking our students to become a Christian or a Muslim or another identity. It means educating our youth about our shared sacred values, and learning how to dialogue with one another about these values for our shared flourishing. My colleagues and I at the University of Bonn have developed a simple curriculum for this purpose called Enemy, Stranger, Neighbor, and Friend, a rough guide on religion and othering. We've piloted this youth program uh, with youth leaders from different countries and faith traditions around the world including several Ethiopian young leaders based in Ethiopia. And we have been amazed by how excited youth were to learn, dialogue, and encourage one another. This curriculum is now being published by the World Council of Churches, and I think it could be an exciting paradigm for programming in Ethiopia. I wanna say 98% of Ethiopians say that religion is very important to them. And around 70 million Ethiopians are under the age of 25. Ethiopia is a young country full of people who deeply desire meaning, belonging, and purpose. So why should these young people grow up ignorant of the best moral teachings of their sacred tradition and the traditions of others? Why shouldn't they experience an inspiring interfaith ethics class in university that educates them in the divine values of human dignity, courageous honesty, and radical compassion? Why shouldn't we have a curriculum that teaches about the evil of war and the flourishing that comes from nonviolence rooted in scientific data? Why shouldn't every Ethiopian student carefully study the human fraternity document and learn this beautiful vision of being human together. Across our traditions, we hear God saying, you are my beloved child. I delight in you. I believe that God says this to Tigrayans and Amharas, to Oromos and Afars, to Gumus and Walaitas, to Emiratis and Americans, Ukrainians and Russians. I believe God says this to Muslims and Christians, to Hindus and atheists, you are my beloved children. This is the sacred voice that can heal othering and that opens the way to a new interfaith flourishing. It unlocks mutual dignity, courageous honesty, and radical compassion. And this opens a new connection for friendship, 
and ethics. Let us energize this vision for our children and the shared moral values in our society. I want to conclude, friends, by inviting you to maybe look um, at your screen at someone who, is, who looks different than you. Would you look at that image of that person's face? And can I invite you to say in your heart, you are God's beloved child. I delight in you. Let us learn to say these healing words to one another again and again, even when we are hurting, even when we're afraid. With this spiritual practice, Dr. Fasica, our enemies will become neighbors. Strangers become friends. And we will find our way forward into flourishing, even when we fear that this is impossible. Thank you. May we all flourish together. Thank you so much, Dr. Andrew. I mean, that was such a beautifully presented um, uh, start to the dialogue. And you've mentioned so much, I can't even begin um, to touch on everything that you had said. But one thing I did want to add before we move on is how you basically highlighted to us how we can unlock religious traditions and practices to move societies into more nonviolent means. Um, another thing that you mentioned or brought to light is how religious theology does show us um, and does mention prior to the treaties that we've signed that we must build partnerships in what you refer to as interfaith friendships, um, as well as promote reconciliation and healing through, as you had said, compassion, dignity, and honesty. And uh, on that note, I really do want to thank you for starting off the discussion with a kick, and, uh, and we, we truly appreciate it. But before we do move on to our next uh, speaker, I wanted to invite